Hey everybody, welcome to the Cards on the Table MMA podcast. Today we're going over some news. A lot of UFC 246 news came out this week. And we're going to talk about the upcoming UFC on ESPN 7 card this weekend. Which, to be honest with you, is not that great. But there's still a few interesting fights on it. So let's go ahead with the news. The big news this week is obviously... Conor McGregor vs. Donald Cerrone announced to headline UFC 246. This fight is going to be at welterweight, which makes it a little bit more interesting, I think. And, again, I, t- I think I talked about this last week. UFC was being really strange about where UFC 246 and UFC 247 were going to be. We were led to believe that John Jones would headline UFC 246, but that looks to have been moved to 247 now. This card, UFC 246, is going to be on January 18th. And what's likely to happen out of this card, or this McGregor-Cerrone fight, is it could set up a potential Masvidal versus McGregor fight for a BMF title type of thing. And then Edwards versus Woodley could be for the next title challenger. I think that's a fair fight. I think Masvidal would happily set back his title aspirations if it meant that he could make the McGregor red panty night, you know? So this brings us to UFC 246. Huge... The card's really starting to come together now, and it's it's a decent card. It's not amazing, but it's decent. So you have McGregor versus Cerrone at welterweight as the main event, and then it looks like the co-main is going to be Anthony Pettis versus Diego Ferreira, which it's a it's a decent fight. It's a, it's an intriguing fight, but it's kind of weak for a co-main. I think that that should be the third or fourth fight on a UFC card. And then you have Holly Holm versus Raquel Pennington. This was announced just the other day. That's, I mean, it's fine. I don't know. Holly Holm, if she wins this fight, she'll make another title shot. Who knows? You have, this is in no particular order from now on. You have Macy Barber versus Roxanne Mataferi. Macy Barber should be interesting to see how she looks. She looked okay in her last fight, but she also wasn't against the best competition. Uh, Drew Dover versus Nasrat Hakparast. Should be an interesting fight. Nasrat trains at TriStar, so should be a fairly well-rounded fighter. You've got Tin Elliott versus Askar Askarov. That should be an interesting flyweight fight. It's uh, it's nice to see Tim Elliott come back so quickly. Yeah, he just lost to Davison for Figueredo, which is no shame in that. That dude is an animal. And Elliott was also coming off like a two-year layoff. It was at least a year and a half. So it's nice to see him come back after just a few months. And you have Andre Philly versus Sodiq Youssef. That's a great fight. This is probably the most exciting fight on the card at the moment. Yusuf has crazy power, and Feely is a very talented fighter, so that should be a, a good one. It's also a pretty big step up for Yusuf. And then you have Alexi Olnik versus Maurice Green. That's whatever, I don't know. Should be a fun fight. Olnik is just so chaotic. Yeah, and then you have Claudia Gadelia versus Alexa Grasso. This should be a pretty decent fight. Alexa Grasso is fairly talented. Gedalia will see if she can fix her cardio issues. She just has massive, massive cardio issues. And it looks like, I don't know if she lost her motivation. I think she lost to Andraj and has just been downhill ever since. But yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes for her. And then the last bit of news for today, for this week, was Corey Anderson versus Jan Blakovic announced for February 15th. This is actually a rematch. Their first fight was UFC 191. And which is, what, two, three, four years ago? I can't even remember anymore. Um, this will obviously be a number one contender fight for light heavyweight. It leaves a little bit in the... It leaves Anthony Smith's future a little bit in the air because he doesn't really have anyone to fight right now. And he's probably still one shot or two shot, two fights away from a title shot. But their first fight, I honestly... I never watched the first fight before. And I was thinking it was just going to be a boring fight because neither of these guys are particularly exciting. But after a competitive first round, Anderson beat the shit out of Blachowicz. And all judges gave rounds 2 and 3 as a 10-8 for Anderson. Which is crazy. So on the scorecards, I think it was 29-25, 30-25, and 30-25. Something insane like that. And I watched some highlights of the fight and it looks like Anderson just mauled him and just yeah, just stayed on top the whole time and just smashed him with elbows. I don't know if you can expect this fight to go the same. It was a long time ago. And 
neither neither of these guys are particularly exciting, which is why I expected the first fight to be, you know, pretty close, 29-28 decision for one of them. But apparently Anderson just destroyed him. So will it be, it'll be interesting to see what adjustments Jan makes. Again, he's much older now, much more experienced. And he's coming off that win over... Who did he just beat? Chris Weidman? No, Jacare, sorry. Against Jacare, so... Anderson coming off that one over Johnny Walker. We'll see if he can carry that confidence with him. But yeah, that's going to do it for the news week. Again, a lot of UFC 246 news and not much else. There were a huge amount of fighter of fight announcements again. But these are the main ones I would say to be concerned about. UFC 246 is coming together. I would like to see one more higher end fight added. One more top 10 or at least top 15 matchup. I think would make this card more interesting. Though again, there's still some pretty interesting prospects and McGregor's on it, so it'll sell well. And I think they kind of know that they don't really have to stack the McGregor cards that much, as much, cause just because he's by far the biggest draw in the sport right now. So yeah, that's going to do it for this week's news. Uh, we'll go into UFC on ESPN7, finally ending the two-week drought. Um, I wanted to keep uploading the podcast just because you know, we're only seven, this is what, the seventh episode, I, yeah, seventh episode, and I wanted to stay active, I don't want to take a two-week break, so it's nice that we're not on the break anymore, but honestly, this card just feels like getting off your 30-minute break at work, and your boss tells you to replace the urinal cakes, it's like, at least you're back on the clock, you're making money, but at the same time, this card is pretty shitty, we'll, but there are some interesting fights, there's a few interesting fights, it's not just all terrible, you have Tim Means versus Thiago Alves, which is obviously a welterweight fight on the... This is headlining the prelims. This was the only real interesting fight on the prelims to me. Both of these guys are about 36 years old. I think Means is almost 36. Alves is over 36. Combined age of almost 72 years old. And neither of these guys are on hot streaks. Means is two out of his last six, coming off a win over... Coming off a loss over Nico Price, I believe. So yeah, he's two in his last six. Alves is two of his last seven. And they've not been fighting bad competition. They've been fighting top 30 guys. But Alves has been on the decline for quite some time. He fought GSP way back in the day, pre-USADA. <clears throat> and Tim Means is just older. So it's an interesting fight just because they have some name value. But it's just this probably will not be a very exciting fight. You have Rob Font versus Ricky Simon. This is a bantamweight fight. Ricky Simon coming off the loss to Uriah Faber, with Uriah Faber making his return. Fairly limited fighter, um, but they both are fairly entertaining, and it's bantamweight. Bantamweight fights are always exciting. And you got Cody Stamen versus Yadong Song. That's another bantamweight fight. Both guys coming off... Actually, this was interesting. Both guys were coming off wins over the same guy, Alejandro Perez. Stamen is an established high rank bantamweight, whereas this is Yadong's biggest step up. So it should be interesting to see how he matches up. Both guys are very exciting. Both have good power for bantamweights. So this should be an entertaining one. You have Aspen Ladd versus Yana Kunitskaya, which is at win women's bantamweight. So I think this is three bantamweight fights in a row. And yeah, I, this is a. I think they're both top 15 women's bantamweights, but honestly, that division is just so weak. Women's strawweight is really only the only women's division that is very interesting to me. Neither of these guys has anything for Amanda Nunes, I don't think. Kunitskaya, I still can't believe this. She fought Chris Cyborg. They brought... She was an invicted champ, I believe, at 135. Kunitskaya was. And then they threw her straight in the ringer with Chris Cyborg at Featherweight, obviously. And she just got her ass kicked. Actually, she looked okay for the first few minutes, and then she just got hit, and was like, well, shit. Also, that fight headlined UFC 222, which was, yikes. And then you have Stefan Struve versus Ben Rothwell, obviously a heavyweight fight. Stefan Struve, for those who don't know, is seven feet tall. I believe he's got to be the tallest fighter in the UFC. Versus Ben Roth Rothwell. Both guys are fairly established heavyweights. Struve actually retired, and he managed to stay retired for 11 months which by MMA standards, that's not that bad. That's pretty good, actually. And I actually, I remember hearing him having a heart condition, and that's why he retired. 
but it turns out that was way back in 2013, and that's not even relevant. And he's on a six-fight uh, contract now with the UFC, so we'll see a lot of Stefan Struve, which you kind of know what you're getting, unless he finally figured out how to use his jab and his range, which he definitely did not. If you've never watched a Stefan Struve fight, he looks very slow and lethargic on the feet and never throws anything from range. And then he'll get taken down at some point, and he has decent grappling because his legs are just massive. His legs are as tall as some of the flyweights, I would guess. Like, he's just crazy. And yeah, he's got some submissions off his back, but in the UFC, that's just so hard. In any MMA setting, it's going to be very hard to get any sit anything off your back. People just get so slippery, there's no gi to hold on to. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he has made any improvements. Again, he hasn't fought in 11 months. I'm assuming he's been training. Totally possible he's a different and reinvented fighter now. Who knows, though? He was not on a hot streak when he retired. Which I believe he lost his last fight. Uh, Rothwell is an a one of those aging heavyweights. He's part of the old guard. And I think he popped for steroids a few fights ago. And had went on a long layoff, or got suspended. And then he's been back, and he is on a three-fight losing streak, all by decision, including a convincing loss to Arlovs Arlovsky in his last fight. And that's not something that has aged well. And, yeah, I don't know. This probably will not be a very exciting fight. And then in the co-main, believe it or not, <laughs> this is Cynthia Cavillo, Cavillo versus Marina Rodriguez. Women's strawweight contender fight. I already talked about women's divisions. Unless it's strawweight. Or this is strawweight, sorry. I thought this was flyweight for a second. Both these women are top 15 strawweights. And I don't know too much about either of them. I'm not going to pretend to know too much about either of them. Uh, this fight is almost assuredly going to a decision. Yeah, so I'm not going to pretend to know anything about this fight. In your main event, you have Alistair Overeem versus Jairzinho Rosenstrick at heavyweight. Now usually, I'm not super into heavyweight fights. Heavyweight, heavyweight is just so slow and not nearly as technical and just so boring a lot of the time. But this fight actually kind of interests me. Um, it's kind of shitty as a main event. Jarzinho is replacing Walt Harris. Obviously, Walt Harris is going through a lot of personal issues right now, which I won't go into details, but essentially his daughter went missing, and we now know that she was kidnapped and murdered so is it's a really tragic situation um it's good that walt harris isn't fighting because he probably needs time to process that again if you want more information just look it up it's been very publicized and looks like they're going to face justice which is good they already had a record but anyway we're not going to go into that too much we're going to focus on the fight here so rosenstruck is going to replace walt harris on short notice and he has just been on an absolute tear through the UFC heavyweight division. All three of his UFC fights have been won by KO. He hasn't seen the third round yet. Two first round knockouts, including a first round, no or yeah, nine second knockout, which is crazy. Um, just came off a KO win over Arlovsky, which we just talked about. That was episode two or three, where I mentioned Arlovsky's chin was just shot. But Rosenstruck, he's also been knocking out people moving backwards with like jabs and short hooks. He hasn't even been hitting people hard. He just has to touch of death, which when you're facing Alistair Overeem, that's a very big advantage because Alistair Overeem, I looked into his striking defense. He has okay striking defense. He, I think it's the ninth best in the heavyweight division. Nothing to gawk at, but it's not terrible. But when you're facing someone with Rosenstruck's power, with Overeem's chin, I mean, even when in his prime Overeem, did not have a great chin. That's bad news. And this, I don't know, this fight kind of reminds me of a Silva versus Adesanya. This is sort of a passing of the torch type of fight because Alistair Overeem came from a kickboxing background. Obviously, he's an ex one of the best strikers in MMA history as far as decoration. And Rosenstruck also comes from a heavy, or from a kickboxing background, has a very good uh, kickboxing record and so this sort of thing if Rosenstruck beats Overeem he kind of takes that torch from him 
Uh, the difference between these guys, though, is Overeem has a much much more MMA experience. Rosenstruck has nine MMA fights. This will be his tenth. This will be Overeem's sixty third MMA fight. This is one of the biggest experience discrepancies I've ever seen. And Alistair Overeem has almost twice as many losses as Rosenstruck has wins. That's that's the type type of thing we're talking about. Other thing is Overeem is a pretty decent grappler. He's worked very well. Worked where he's uh, improved his grappling ability very, quite substantially. He was always a decent grappler, good submissions, though he hasn't had a submission since two thousand nine. But he is a decent wrestler, and he does show it. He does use it every once in a while. And Rosenstruck's takedown defense has not not looked very good against against actual man baby Junior Albini, which was his first UFC fight, I believe. He he got taken down at least twice. Had a very strange. Just looked like he didn't really know what he was doing. He would fight for the underhooks and then sort of stop. Like he wouldn't do anything with underhooks. Just hold on. And I don't really know what he was waiting for. But, um, yeah, so then he was getting thrown around basically by, man, again, Man Baby Junior Alpini. It's just so strange. His body type is so strange. And, again, this it was, that was his first UFC fight, but that was only 10 months ago. And this is a potential issue with pushing guys up the rankings too quickly. And you see this with guys like Darren Till, who don't have the best striking defense, and then get, get pushed up the welterweight rankings. And just get destroyed by Tyron Woodley, and then Jorge Masvidal, and this could be this could be another fight where that is the case. Again, this was only ten months ago, where Junior Albini, a guy who very few people have heard of, is throwing you around. And again, Rosenstruck came back and got the knockout in the second round. But still, if Junior Albini can take you down, and threaten you with submissions, I mean, he threatened him with a Kimura, I believe, at least twice, and an Americana, maybe even, and he had the back as well in the first round, if I'm remembering that correctly. But yeah, I think Overeem probably won't sub him, because Overeem hasn't had a sub in 10 years, doesn't mean he's not capable of it, you know, he doesn't just, he doesn't just forget how to do a guillotine, but... I think the threat of the submissions will be more helpful to Overeem than actually going for the submissions. Especially at heavyweight, guys can just do stand-up jitsu like, like Derek Lewis does and just get out of stuff. So I think it's better to threaten it, to use it, to keep them down. And that seems to be a general theme in MMA. Guys like Colby Covington use that, where they just hang onto your neck. Or Habib does this as well, that type of grinding style. I'm not saying that Overeem will use this, but it, it would be smart of him to do so because... It means you can't just put both your hands on the ground and stand up when your opponent has your has one arm under your neck. You can't just put two hands down. That's your Conor McGregor. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, Overeem can wear on him. We don't know if Rosenstruck's power will carry. I think the longer this fight goes, probably it's an Overeem's advantage. But again, we don't know. We haven't seen Rosenstruck go more than six or seven minutes in a UFC fight. And we don't know if his power will translate. If he does have just that touch of death power, it might still, it'll probably still work. Another thing is Rosenstruck's striking defense was not that great. He was getting hit by Junior Albini. He's just over him, can't overextend himself, which he is pretty good at that. His striking is fairly well put together. And he doesn't overextend himself a lot of the time. He's, you know, his, his striking has aged fairly well, given how long he's been in the game. And I just think, I don't know, I don't think standing with Rosenstroke is a good idea because I mentioned Overeem's um, striking defense. Orlowski is actually number three in active heavyweights in striking defense. And look what happened to him. So I don't, th I don't think Overeem should rely on his striking defense. I think he will get hit. And Rosenstroke has shown that anything he hits you with has power and has enough power to knock you out. So... Over him should wrestle him, tire him out, and again threaten the submission, but don't use it. Over him st generally seems to be content with chilling in people's guard and just going with elbows and ground and pound, and I think that's a fairly safe option. Rosenstruck again doesn't have great 
stand-ups either. He's not very technical. He uses a lot of energy to stand up very explosive. And if you can make him do that for five rounds, we don't know how he's going to hold up because we just we just don't know. It might He might have amazing cardio, but he also might just be like every other heavyweight, which seems more the more likely scenario. So yeah, and this fight's a tough one to predict. My gut is telling me Rosenstruck is just going to... He only needs one punch. It's like what we were saying with Deontay Wilder. You have to be perfect for 25 minutes. Rosenstruck have to be, has to be perfect for a fraction of a second. He just has to hit you with one punch. Seemingly, again, with a guy wh who gets tends to get knocked out in Alistair Overeem. That seems to be the most likely outcome. Overeem is the favorite, I believe, though, which was kind of surprising to me. This is kind of Overeem's worst matchup, if you think about it. Because... Rosenstruck just has that power, and that seems to be sort of like an Nganu type fight again for Overeem. But who knows? We're, we'll see. This. I also don't like just giving punchers chances, though, because it's a chance. Overeem will be the more technical fighter. That's not to say Rosenstruck isn't more isn't technical. He has good striking, but I don't know. He just doesn't have that. He doesn't have time to age it. MMA, he, this will be his 10th fight against a really experienced fighter. It's an interesting fight, though. This is a very interesting fight. I'm excited to watch it. And yeah, I think that's going to do it for this week's episode. Kind of a short one today, but again, there's not much to talk about. Next week will be a very long episode because we've got UFC 245 coming up. Thank God we're, I'm in dire need of a good card. <laughs> there's, this is just such a lack of good fights. But yeah, I think that's going to do it for this week's episode, guys. Thanks for thanks for sticking around till the end of the episode. If you guys enjoy the podcast, leave give it a like, give it a review. Let me know what you guys want to see more of. And yeah, I think that's going to do it. Try to share it with a friend if you enjoy it. You know, word of mouth is always the best way to promote. And yeah, I will see you guys soon. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. Hope the card is good. And peace out.